Hey everybody, here is Dominic Gear from the Breakdown Show, and today's guest is Aaron Hale. He was an EOD technician in Afghanistan for six years, when in December 2011, an unseen IED exploded in his face. That cost him his vision. After the accident, he rehabilitated himself to an extent that most sighted people would envy, running marathons, climbing mountains, and even solo water kayaking. But his life tragedy didn't stop there. He was diagnosed with meningitis and that cost him his hearing. He became 100% blind and 100% deaf. But mama didn't raise a quitter. He opened his own company with his amazing wife, Michaela. The company is called EOD Confections. You can visit them on EOD Confections on social media or on eodfudge.com and support their work. Now, while I have you in that website surfing mood, here's what I want you to do. Create a new tab, because you need that TOD fudge for ordering cookies. Go to that new tab and write savethebrave.org. Subscribe! Support these guys as they are supporting veterans on our show. While you are an amazing human being supporting Aaron Hale and Save the Brave, go on Spotify, Stitcher, or iTunes, or wherever you listen to the Break It Down show and click subscribe and give us a short comment. Something like, Aaron Hale is one of America's greatest warriors, and I want to order some of his cookies. Because, oh yeah, he started as a cook in the Navy SEAL, and then he became an EOD technician. Now, that's an upgrade. While I was editing this episode, there's a part in the show where he says, When I lost my vision after the explosion, I immediately asked myself, how I'm gonna be a soldier? And what amazes me the most is that he says, how I'm gonna be a soldier. He didn't say, I'm not gonna be a soldier. Now that's the heroism and motivation we all definitely need. On today's episode, the best-selling author, Scott Husing, joins Pete A. Turner as they discover Aaron Hale's story. Without further ado, enjoy the show. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Aaron Hale from EOD Confections, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. So this is going to blow your minds. Aaron is a vet. We have these guys on all the time. Best-selling author Scott Husing is co-hosting. And I want to explain one thing to you. The show you're about to hear is recorded with a guy that is 100% blind and 100% deaf. He is remarkable, and you're going to have your mind blown. So I'm going to... uh, I'm going to talk with Aaron. Sometimes we're going to go a little slower just because how he hears and processes this information, you know, he's got to work through a couple of things. So first off, Aaron, wow, man, you are my hero. You're so inspirational. The fact that challenge accepted mindset that you have. Last night, Scott and I met Gary Sinise and we got to, get, got to hang out with uh, Josue Barone. And uh, Josue is such an inspirational guy. He lost his leg. He lost an eye. And just, you guys are all indomitable. And I just, uh, if no one else has said it, man, I'm, I'm proud of how you guys live your life and the inspiration that you provide to all of us. So thanks, man. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate that. And, uh, thanks to you, Pete and Scott, for having me on. I love the show. And uh, it's an honor to be invited. Yeah, everybody, you can check him out at EOD Confections on all social media or EOD Fudge, eodfudge.com. Aaron started in the Navy as a cook and then moved over to the Army as an EOD tech. Let's talk about you getting into the Navy and give us an idea of, of that path so that we can understand who you who you were back then. You know, I'd been cooking since I could reach over the counter uh, and I was making you know, lunches for myself, my brother and sister. Uh, this was like back in third and fourth grade. Uh, and I worked my way from, all the way from Chuck E. Cheese up to McDonald's and all of those franchise places uh, in my hometown. I just, I knew I loved cooking. But I didn't really have a whole lot of purpose or direction when I was younger. Not a whole lot of ambition for just about anything. I was, I was loving life, but kind of adrift to use the Navy terms. When I got to college, I really still didn't know where I was going to go or what I was going to do. I picked some general major and really just went looking for Animal House. 
And well, I made it just like the movie. Three freshman semesters later and about 50 pounds later, I realized <laughs> I was just burning up tuition. So it was kind of a mutual thing. I didn't really want to be there any longer and neither did the university. So I needed to turn my, my, my life around and do a little uh, soul searching and find some direction. That's when I decided you know, I was going to join the Navy. I lost a ton of weight and before going to the recruiter, didn't know exactly what the Navy was all about, but I knew that uh, they had cooks in the Navy. And I wanted to, I decided I was going to become a chef. I wanted to go to culinary school. So the original plan was four years, get that GI bill, get out and continue on this new course I'd, I'd uh, selected for myself. You know, eight years later, I'm still in the Navy and loving being a sailor. I had the, the distinct opportunity to get stationed four of those eight years in Italy. Wow. And first two years, my first duty station was in Naples, Italy. And I got off the plane uh, with my you know, sea bag and over my shoulder and said, where am I going to be cooking? And they said, oh, no, I don't know. They don't tell you in basic or, you know, in the A school, your technical school, that the cooks in the Navy, they, they, they look at it like hotel restaurant management. So when we're cooking out at sea, when we're on shore duty, we're not cooking because that's all civilian contractors on bases. No, the cooks on shore duty run the barracks. <laughs> I got trained as a Navy cook and then got placed in the maintenance department. So I was walking around with trouble call tickets from the front desk and a uh, you know a local national <laughs> Italian public works uh, uh, you know plumber or electrician had it was kind of a kind of a surprise, but I made it work and um, no, all day long I was pointing at things and saying "Come si dice, come si dice. How do you say this? How do you say?" This? I learned how to speak Italian with around a bunch of roughnecks. But uh, it was great. I, I immersed myself in the culture. I loved, of course, the Italian cuisine and you know, coffee and, and, and everything about Italy. Spent two years at that shore duty, and then I PCS. My next duty station was only 45 minutes away. It was the commander of the Sixth Fleet flagship Wow! in Gaeta, Italy. So now I was cooking for a three-star admiral and his staff. And I got to make real food, not... Uh, not to, to disparage the, uh, the the ship's you know galley, but we were doing some some really good you know cuisine and and every time the ship went out to to sea, you know the the flagship doesn't do the the the, the six month West Pack or you know those six month cruises like uh, carrier groups. The uh, flagship would go out for three or four weeks, hit about three or four ports, run up the flag, have a reception uh, with the local dignitaries, and then head right back to Italy. And it was fantastic. I got with the ship, I got to see half the countries bordering the Mediterranean. And then on my leave and liberty time, I got to go you know, tour around Europe, like Germany and France and, and all over the place. So it was an amazing experience. And it was phenomenal. So you guys weren't defrosting chicken cordon bleu and serving that on a plate like I get to eat? Oh, yeah. We would make all sorts of things. Uh, it, it, the funny thing is my time on the flagship spanned two different admirals, and both of them turned out to be more of the burger and fries type of guys. Mm. Uh, so we'd make the fanciest burgers and fries you'd ever had. But one thing we were forbidden to do was cook Italian food. <laughs> uh, go figure. When you're living in Italy, who wants the Americans to make the Italian food for you? Right. What I love about that story too is for all the veterans listening, they can totally understand. You join the Navy, you're going to do one job and you wind up doing everything but your job, basically. You can become a garbage man or a hotel attendant or pumping gas or changing tires. It's like you never get sold that bill of goods. But then when you get onto the flagship, and Pete doesn't doesn't know this either, Aaron, because he was in the army. But when you're at the flag level, that job is probably one of the best on either the amphib or the carrier strike group that you could possibly have, because you are totally in the inner circle with the the flag and general level officers that have all these receptions and the dignitaries and. You, I mean, you're that guy on the wall. I mean, there's got to, you must have a ton of stories that, uh, you know, crossed your path when you were doing that. 
Yeah, it was great. We we got to make some pretty terrific food for some very interesting characters. So uh, from heads of state to uh, royalty. Hey, this is P. Day Turner from the Break It Down Show, checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to savethebrave.org. Click on the Donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. We got to make some pretty terrific food for some very interesting characters. So uh, from heads of state to uh, royalty, all sorts of people uh, came aboard this ship and got to serve them and show off uh, our skills. It was, a, it was a terrific time. And uh, while in port, we still had uh, our liberty time and we'd go out and enjoy the local customs and uh, the local fair and maybe hoist a pint or two. And how old were you when you were doing all this during your first enlistment? I started in uh, September 1999. I was 21. That's pretty cool because most young kids to have that type of experience just to give some perspective of the level that you were working at and the responsibility you had to that staff. And then also the, the adventure factor of being on this massive floating vessel and then hitting all these cool Liberty ports and, and traveling the world. You, you really, that that's even for guys in the military, uh, y- your job, although most people don't think we have these chefs and culinary experts in the military, we do. And to be a part of that is, I mean, that's a pretty unique experience. So uh, do you think a lot of that was what propelled you into what you're doing now with EOD Fudge? A lot of the influences that I received while I was I was cooking in the Navy uh, are apparent in the fudge. Yeah, in fact, one of our one of my favorite flavors is uh, American Pick Me Up, which is a uh, all American twist on tiramisu, which literally translated means pick me up. Huh? Yeah, it's got. Hmm. Coffee, alcohol, chocolate, nuts. It's got all those things that, uh, you know, combine great stuff, great flavors, and, uh, you know, one dessert. So, what I did was I, instead of hazelnuts, we use Georgia pecans. We use American roasted coffee instead of espresso. And, and instead of uh, Frangelico, put uh, good old American uh, bourbon cream in there. And it's a layer of white and uh, dark chocolate. So let's not get too far into the confection, the cooking side too much. I want to, you were starting to talk and transition into your EOD stuff. How does that happen? Do you separate completely from the Navy and not figure like, you know, have the same kind of uh, transition you have with school where you're like, nope, you know what? This is what I, I don't know. Help me fill in the blanks here. What happens for the EOD transition? As the joke goes, I, uh, once I got my first confirmed kill with an egg roll, I decided I wanted to start saving lives as a, a EOD <laughs> technician. But uh, uh, the truth is, I, I once the both wars were in full swing, you know, I was we were out in the Mediterranean, and uh, you know when when Bush had that they gave that ultimatum to Saddam, we were you know floating right off the coast of Turkey, and you know I I watched those Aegis destroyers floating beside us send missiles from their decks, fly off into the distance, and uh, and then we'd go turn on CNN and watch them land. <laughs> it was that point that I realized that, you know, I, I love being in the service. I found my calling. Uh, it, 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 and I found duty, uh, a greater sense of patriotism. But I wanted to do something a little more, a little more direct. You know, I love cooking, but um, like I said, something a little bit more. So... When I returned to the United States, I was stationed in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and I volunteered for individual augmentee status, which uh, it's you know piecemeal units of uh, sailors and airmen that uh, fill in. Uh, at the time, were just army billets in Afghanistan. So basically, went from cooking for the admiral and his staff to running an army defac on uh, Fab Farah in Afghanistan. And now I was cooking for six and seven hundred ISAF you know, troops while I was there. It was you know a bit of a culture shock and a bit of a, a different pace. But uh, I met some EOD technicians, explosive ordnance disposal, 
And they were, of course, doing some, you know, preventive maintenance on some of their equipment. It was like a a, a, a garage sale of cool guy gear, you know, mm -hmm. uh, bomb suits and mm -hmm. robots and all that sorts of stuff. So I got talking to these guys and I was hooked right from the get go. You know, that, that tight knit brotherhood, the intelligence uh, side, uh, Pete, like, like you. Uh, and then, of course, we're saving lives. And that really appealed to me, you know, taking an explosive, uh, you know, uh, unexploded ordnance and, and improvised uh, devices off the battlefield. That sounded, sounded just up my alley. And that's what I love to do. Of course, these guys said one day, uh, hey, Spoon, you want to come with us on a, a, a controlled disposal? We've got some rockets and landmines we just got to get rid of. Sure, why not? Uh, I was out there and uh, they even let me uh, pop the thing off. So um, I got to do my first control detonation and man, I was hooked. So uh, as soon as I got back from Afghanistan, I put in the paperwork, the request to go strike from culinary specialist to EOD in the Navy. But at that time, this was 2007, EOD wasn't its own rate or MOS in the Navy. It was a qualification, a specialty. And you had to come from certain source rates. And cook really isn't a source rate for anything else. I was petty officer second class, E5. It was undermanned. E6 was overmanned. So they weren't going to let me leave to another job. They weren't even going to promote me. So my contract was running out and I, I, I let it expire and walked over to the army recruiter, handed them my paperwork and they welcomed me in. Uh, so uh, that, I, I kept my, my rank. I went from petty officer to sergeant and they trained me up to be a soldier in the EOD tech. So that, that's a good point for the transition thing. Like, as you manage your career in the military. You, know, you look at what's ahead of you and, and sometimes you get into a wave where a bunch of people have been promoted in front of you and it doesn't really matter how good you are because there's just no billets like the, the people in front of you are already there and they're always going to be there so the next promotion and the next so you're, you're right like you have to manage that part of it and, and unfortunately you have to change service just in general how would you compare the experience between the army and the navy i'm not trying to disparage either of them but just What's what stood out to you as being different, better, worse, et cetera? Apples and oranges. It really is. They're they're totally different environments. And you know, I'm sure you've heard those those jokes about the different languages in the, the military and how they all speak different lingo. Uh, it, it's it really is a different cultures, but to compare them is impossible. Uh, I I'd, I'd say I I loved both uh, my time uh, in the navy and the army for multitude of different reasons. And I gained a wealth of experience from both of them. Um, you know, as a sailor, uh, I got to tour the world. I got to see some of the, the, the best parts of the Mediterranean and Europe. I got to do the, uh, you know, cooking and I get to, you know, experience underway, you know, sea life. And that was, it was, a, you know, I, I treasure that time. In the army, I got to eat as much dust as there was available. But uh, it, it, I slept out in the desert under the stars. I got to, to you know, train to be an EOD technician and save lives. And, and it, I don't know. There's it, being on the ground in the desert in a battlefield in many ways scary, as terrible, as, as awful as it was, I miss it like hell. I'm sure many of uh, you know, your past guests have uh, the same experience. There is something about the, the camaraderie, the, the shared horror of the whole thing that brings you together. And there's nothing like it. And I think that's part of the reason so many of us have trouble coming home. And you know, getting their their old lives or new lives back together is because there's not a bond, or not a, an experience like it. There's absolutely no way that you can replicate what you went through. And you went from blowing up souffles in this <laughs> glamorous, uh, posh, you know, lifestyle in the military to really one of the most sought after 
in demand, tight knit communities service wide because EOD guys, for listeners who don't know, these guys are nuts. They literally go out looking for bombs and then they put more explosives on top of those bombs and then blow them up. And, you know, that is a skill that was, especially in Afghanistan, the IED threat, these bombs that they would bury with 50 pounds at times of homemade explosive and, and artillery shells that were captured from the enemy. They would bury these things along these very predictable routes and anything that wasn't observed got ID and they buried this. And this is what was probably one of the biggest killers and threats from the Taliban in Afghanistan. And your job, I've got so many EOD friends and as a commander in Iraq and Ramadi, having those guys was so invaluable. So I, I'm sharing that with the listeners, but I think that, um, you know, that's a really, a really unique job, a really unique transition. And then to do all of those things in that environment at the height of, of some of the worst fighting in Afghanistan and, you know, from like 09 to 11 is really tight, man. I know a lot of guys that, you know, got injured over there and saw some really, really heavy fighting, you know, but you talk about it in a sense that is almost poetic about sleeping under the stars mm -hmm. and getting the war that you always wanted. And I hear that from a lot of guys. And then Aaron, you say how much you miss that. And it's kind of incomprehensible to the public to think that you would miss that aspect of your military career, vice being on this luxury naval vessel to all these glamorous ports and being A-list, to slogging it out with soldiers on the ground and really helping people. How do you think you help the most when you say you wanted to take care of other people? You're absolutely right about that. It's hard to explain the experience and it's hard for others who haven't experienced it to, to understand that shared misery and shared, you know, sometimes we were even, we were having fun. I, 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 uh, I, in my downtime, which was limited, I, I even going back to my, my cooking roots, even made a Afghan mud brick pizza oven in the uh, right behind my hooch. If you're talking there on the battlefield, it was, of course, getting those, those, uh, those hazards before they got to our troops and our allies. Now I just hope I can empathize sympathize, I can share my story, and hopefully I can help those fellow veterans that may be having a hard time getting back to the real world. Do you talk about that that day in, in December of 2011 when that bomb went off in your face? How do you share that experience to, I mean, could, because I'm asking the question because you just said you can, you like to share that and, and you can empathize and sympathize with, you know, those that not only were lost, but experienced that type of trauma. And you and so many, I mean, God, the number of guys that Pete and I know that have been through and survived to yeah. survive that type of explosion and then talk about that publicly, that takes so much courage, brother. And I think that's important for people to understand. And what I would like to hear is not just about that day, but how you've talked about the road to recovery. It was... December 8th, 2011, I was just back. I was just off the flight back from my two weeks of R&R. &R, and I'd gotten to see my son turn one. Mm -hmm. Got to share Thanksgiving with the family. And even got to see my dad dress up as Mickey Mouse for my son's birthday, which is, you know, to know my, my dad is a once in a lifetime thing. My team picked me up in the, the Jerv, the armored truck, and I threw my, my luggage in the back seat. And we, we joined a convoy to head out to our command outpost. Along the way, there was a, an IED. So the, the, the convoy commander called back to EOD and said, you know, asked if we could get to work on it. We were just tag alongs on this convoy and weren't even, you know, the QRF for the AO, but why would we pass it up? And why would we, there's no way I would say no and have us all sit and wait for, you know, the duty team to, to come out here. Uh, so, so of course we set uh, security cord on and as soon as everything was set, you know, we sent the robot out. The robot discovered a pressure plate ID with a 
jug of HMV, which is 99% of the IEDs out there in Afghanistan. So the robot had taken the pressure plate apart and pulled that away from the IED. So it was now didn't have its trigger, but it couldn't get the jug out of the hard packed dirt. And we wanted to get as much evidence as possible so we can get back to the bomb maker. And, and as long as we could do it safely, there's no reason to just, you know, put another hole in the dirt without collecting evidence. So I jumped out of the truck and had my IED evidence kit in one hand and my uh, metal detector in the other. And I started sweeping my way forward about 20 or 30 meters from the original ID, the secondary device that hadn't been discovered yet, detonated. And I got the mule kick from hell. Mm -hmm. It punted me into the air and I landed my knees and elbows. I was still conscious, but the lights had gone completely out. It was nighttime, but, you know, the lights on our on those EOD trucks, we can light up the night. And I had every spotlight on me and, and on the uh, IED, and everything was pitch black now. So I originally thought that my helmet had gotten pushed all the way over my face. But the first thing to do was the systems check function check wiggle the fingers wiggle wiggle the toes move elbows and knees and it seemed that everything was intact more or less so i reached up to adjust my helmet just to find that my helmet was gone and that's when i thought oh no this is bad yeah the army is going to want that helmet back <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Um, Sergeant Major is going to be pissed. I'm going to have to pay for that. <laughs> oh no, I can't. I can't tell Top I lost my helmet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Seriously, mm -hmm. a couple things that you said. One, the audience probably doesn't know this. Every time we found an IED, if possible, like Aaron's saying, they would try to take the evidence off of the IED. Who made this thing? Whose fingerprints are on it? What you know, they're really trying to break these things down to the point where they're like they're taking fingerprints off of any part of this thing. It would amaze you what happens. So, yes, there's a bomb and we're trying to make it work and everything, but these guys are still trying to catch bad guys. This is an opportunity to exploit something that the bomb maker never even considers being possible. So, and then the other thing, when you have gear from the army, especially the army, if you put your gear in the trunk of your car and someone steals it. It doesn't matter that someone stole it. You were irresponsible because you didn't double lock it and secure it. So when your helmet goes missing, Aaron, I patrolled so much that I wore the Velcro out of my body armor and my, uh, I guess you would call it the, the blanket, but the protective blanket fell out of the back of it. I didn't even know it was on the patrol somewhere. It fell out. And I was like, oh shit, there goes $800, you know? And luckily that unit was so, they knew how much we patrolled. They just gave me a new one. But that was my first thought was, oh shit, there goes 800 bucks of my money. So I'll shut up and get out of your way. But I wanted to provide some of that context. Well, I know you uh, uh, appreciate uh, the intel side. And uh, you know, prior to my uh, deployment to Afghanistan, I was uh, I was deployed to Iraq this time. You know, this is my first deployment as an EOD tech. And I was assigned to Task Force Troy, which is the uh, where the uh, counter explosives exploitation cell is, uh, or sexy cell. And that's where all the team EOD team's evidence gets sent for triage and it gets split up from chemical analysis, uh, biometrics, like you said, the uh, fingerprints and hair samples, skin samples, that kind of stuff, to electronics and everything we can pull apart from this these IEDs. And it gets sent not just to DIA, but FBI, ATF, and all the other shareholders, stakeholders in the fight against uh, terrorism. So it was always, you know, learning that helped me when I became a team leader and I was, you know, had my boots on the ground and every single incident, yeah, you know, somebody would say, you're going to bip it, you bip it, you know, and, and it'd be so easy to throw a charge on these things and bip, you know, blow in place is just, you know, when it's too, too hazardous to mess with, you throw a charge on it, blow it in place and then, you know, carry on. And if it was at all possible and I could do it safely. I wanted to get as much evidence as I could so we could get 
if you look think of a timeline, you know, get left of the blast. It was the worst feeling in the world getting to an incident and all you had was a crater and possibly some body parts. I wanted to get to the IED and dismantle it, but I wanted to get further left where you've got the bomb placer, you got the bomb maker, you got the bomb finance, and we wanted to get all the way down that timeline to the left. Yeah, that's a big deal. All of that stuff, I could wander into classified territory pretty easily here. But um, yeah, you, there are plenty of times when you guys show up, put some C4 on it and blow the crap out of it. But the sooner we can get that bomb maker off of the streets, the harder it is for for the enemy to continue to, I mean, those EFPs, those were motherfuckers, you know, because they had, they'd hide these bombs, picture like a coffee can hanging up in a tree. So if you can see it, you're lucky. And a lot of times they were arrayed just to kind of blast out randomly. And these things were so dangerous because it would shoot a molten copper ball right through the armor of your truck. No matter how strong your truck was, it goes right through. And so when you found these things, it was terrifying because the work that you did, Aaron, helping save us guys, God damn, man. I don't know how many times, and I'm sure Scott's the same way, we had to pause everything and let you guys come in and take care of some nasty stuff. And like you said, the secondary, the tertiary, the the fourth thing in the chain, you were always worried about it being there. Even if it wasn't there, you had to account for it. That's I, there's a lot of things in this whole conversation that I wish I could tease out better because it, it is part of what damages all of us, that tension of waiting for that big boom, you know, and, and I think about the people all the time that would do route clearance and drive at five miles an hour all night, all over Baghdad or Mosul or, you know, anywhere trying to find these bombs. These people are trying to find bombs and the bombs are trying to find them. It's just, God damn, man, it's really it's incredible that you had that mission and you were so called to it. I, I really admire that. Oh, thank you. And, you know, during this deployment to Afghanistan, when I, before I was injured, you know, we, were, we were really busy. It wasn't the high tech stuff that uh, we, were, we were experiencing in Iraq. It was so low tech that it was, it was befuddling us. You know, these jugs with lamp cord wire and some plywood pressure plates. It was so low tech that uh, it was hard, hard to find. And, yeah. and then it was just everywhere. It would just it, every time you took a step or you pulled out of the ECP, you were just expecting an explosion. Those route clearance guys were losing a truck every other day, and just glad that I got to as many as I could before uh, you know more of our our troops were were injured. Yeah, we had um, a bomb. It was literally a oil jug, like uh, for cooking oil, a bunch of motorcycle parts. And just a bunch of accelerant in there. And it went off. And I guess it wouldn't necessarily, and this will sound crazy to the audience, but it wouldn't necessarily kill anybody because it was just a low yield thing. But it hit people mm -hmm. and knocked them out of the fight for a while. And unfortunately for the Afghans, it was targeted at them and blown up on them. But like th this bomb was just poorly made. But one of those things where it was so easy to put somewhere and so cheap, they just put them everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it didn't have to kill. No. All it had to do was get one, one guy out of the fight. If it took one guy's foot, that's a couple guys that need to carry him. You got to bring a medic into the scene, possibly a, you know, a medevac chopper. Now you've got resources all consolidated in one location, and that's when the ambush happens or a, some kind of coordinated attack or a secondary device gets gets more of our troops it wasn't about killing on the first shot it was it was about you know diverting resources so you can consolidate and and do more damage it, it's a it's a real demoralizing factor the unknown and i don't know if there's a example that you could share that most civilians would would relate to i mean it's kind of like I don't know, for the average driver, they're going down the road and there's a, a, a huge collision and it makes you take stock of, oh, I better be a safer driver. But there's this unknown is like, oh, could that happen to me? It's so hard to articulate to those that have not been surrounded by that level of certain death where it could, it's literally buried inches below the road. Some are command detonated where they squeeze a trigger. Some are pressure plates. You just run over this thing. And then there's always a secondary or tertiary device that, hey, if the first one didn't get you, 
we made a plan to back it up and we're going to blow you up with that too. The things you guys do is just probably the most harrowing, you know, spine chilling job that there is out there. And I love my EOD guys. And I had a, a, a major cash we found in Ramadi. It was probably shit, man, 25 feet long stacked with all kinds of contraband we dug up out of the ground. And out of the blue, this EOD team rolls through request permission to enter my friendly lines. We do the name game, blah, blah, blah. And they just happened to be from Camp Pendleton, my home station. And it wasn't until my book came out, I get this IM on Facebook and there's this guy, he says, Hey, sir, my name is Staff Sergeant Clip Flop and I'm in the Bahamas right now and I'm reading your book. That was me. <laughs> I was the EOD tech that night. And I was like, I chills reading this thing. And he reached out to me when he read the book. But man, you talk about a small world, brother. It was, it was fascinating. And I was just texting while I was listening to this riveting story, Anthony Zucker, who's the creator of CSI. And I said, dude, new show. I'm talking to this guy, Aaron, fascinating, the forensics. I said, new show, CSI Afghanistan. Yeah. Like that's, yeah, we'll bring you in as a technical advisor if he bites on that. But it's just amazing. But, you know, after all that, let's let's talk about that term you use, the road to recovery. So all that, the healing, and then really picking yourself back up and trying to drive on with your life now that you've been blinded, you've lost your hearing, and the, the physical to the mental state, and doing what you do, great. So now, it is inspiring people that, you can suffer loss and endure all of this trauma, yet still be so successful in everything you're doing. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. It is inspiring people that you can suffer loss and endure all of this trauma yet still be so successful in everything you're doing? You know, I, I owe quite a bit to uh, my military training and the support I got uh, both from my, my family and my uh, military family. You know, after the explosion, it was it took, took 48 hours and I was in Walter Reed. Wow. Um, they kept me for 24 hours in a land stool just to make sure that uh, there wasn't too much swelling in my brain. The blast had just hit me, uh, thankfully, I guess, uh, hit me just in the head. From the neck down, I was virtually untouched. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that happened, but um, it took my, my eyes, cracked my skull. I was leaking spinal fluid right out my nose, blowing out both my eardrums and you know, I had tons of scarring and burns on my face. I was sitting there at uh, the bed, Walter Reed, trying to figure out what I was going to do next. Uh, at first, it, it didn't really didn't really hit me. I was too busy doing surgeries and recovering and uh, the counselors and, and admin come and take, you know, did this paperwork and all this kind of stuff. And as soon as I was out of Walter Reed, they asked me, you know, where do you want to retire? What's your mindset? Like, so yes, you're going through these surgeries, but like, are you like, I'm going to get better? Have you accepted that you're going to, that your sight is gone? Is there any kind of a grieving process for this injury? What's, what's your state of mind at Walter Reed? I, I know you're busy surgeries and recovering, but that's, that, that covers a lot of time though, man. You know, I was in Walter Reed for about five weeks. You know, it's not, not like, um, an amputee, you know, you lose a limb, there's therapy, there's, there's you know, the physical therapy, the surgeries, then you got to get the prosthetic. For me, it was basically stop the bleeding and there was, you know, re removing some, some frag, from my face, but really there was not much they could do for me. There was something called an encephalocele, which is uh, take a piece of um, your septum and patch the cracks in my skull. Wow. Once I was healed up enough, I was going to get sent to one of the uh, VA's blind rehabilitation centers so I could learn to be blind. But in that, that short time I was able to read, it really was, I just sat there in my, my bed and I try to figure out, you know, first, why did this happen to me? 
I was, you know, one of those, you know, we talked about it, uh, the, the highly trained explosive ordnance disposal t- uh, technician, a subject matter expert. How did this piece of junk, you know, cobbled together, how did it get me? And, you know, I was getting down on myself for failing and then in failing my team, failing the mission. And then it was, what, what the hell am I going to do next? I'm blind. I, how am I going to be the father? How am I going to be a soldier? Right there, though. How am I going to be a soldier? There's no quit in you. You know, like you haven't said, well, I can't be a soldier anymore. How am I going to be a soldier? Man, that's fucking awesome. So go forward a little bit now. So they're saying retire. And it sounds like you weren't even considering it. Well, no, no. Maybe it was a bit denial. Maybe it's my you know, uh, thick headedness, which probably saved my life. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It was just how can I do this? And I, you know, then when I when I uh, speak to groups, I talk about my time in Afghanistan and being an EOD uh, technician and how every EOD team in the army, it's usually a three person team. Every team is given nearly a a whole shipping container. You know, what are those uh, quad cons or tri cons Mm -hmm. full of gear from bomb suits to encrypted publications to hazmat uh, gear and chemical, biological, nuclear, anything you can uh, think of to, to battle between bullets and nuclear weapons, we have it in a, in a shipping container. And that goes with the team overseas. But then once you're like in Iraq, you get you know the truck, this armored truck, a jerv, and you got to decide what tools you're going to be able to fit in this thing. And you have limited space. So you jam stuff under the seats and in the shelves and in those boxes on the outside. And we even kept stuff in our gun turret nest because we're not putting a a turret gunner up there. We used it as storage. Uh, So everywhere we could, we put as much tools as we could in there, but we left a lot behind. And then we get to Afghanistan and you get those goat trails that can't support any vehicles. So now you got your rucksack. All right, what tools go in that rucksack? You know, you get some basically some bare C4 charges, carabiner, grappling hook, a rope. And then it's there's just enough room for your MREs and water and maybe a spare pair of socks. That's how and with that, we had to do the same job. You know, we were expected to do the same job as if we had the entire shipping container full of tools. So now I'm short. A uh, very important tool, but I have a lot more tools that I had just had to rely on skills, people, you know, other teammates, and my own creativity and, and willpower to, to carry on. I had the tools and I can continue to do this. Mm-hmm. I just short some tools. I think, I think it's amazing. No, not many people hear someone say, I had to learn how to be blind. And I don't think. A lot of people understand that. And it's remarkable because the community, you said family earlier as well. And I think that's really thematic of not just combat vets, but the military, how we support each other. And there's been people on the show and Pete and I, the circles we run in and now to meet you, I mean, the number of people that we know with prosthetic eyes uh, who've been on the show, like John McKay, Steve Mount. Josue Barone, Ben Cassio, Kyle Carpenter, Medal of Honor, and now Aaron Hill. I mean, most civilians don't know one guy. And we have this family that I love being able to share your story and what you did and to do it willingly too and to raise your hand and say, you know, I want a more dangerous job because being on an aircraft carrier and floating around at sea isn't dangerous enough. I need some more danger. And you took all of that, all of the loss, all of the trauma, You retooled yourself, your body, your physical and mental state, and you applied that to marathons and climbing and whitewater kayaking and adventure sports. And now you're a successful confectioner. And I I really want to talk about just that success story, man, because you really are a super success story that people can learn from. And I think that's such an important message. And talk to us about how you feel about coming through that and all the success you have now. I'm extremely lucky 
person. I've survived an explosion. And then nearly four years later, the meningitis nearly killed me. After I had graduated from blind guy school, um, <laughs> uh, I had to figure out what to do. Term. Mm. Do you get a patch for that in the army? Blind guy school, like yes, razor tab, and a ribbon, and, and, a, <laughs> and a V device. <laughs> well, you know they they, they teach you, you know, the, how to use those ad- adaptive tools. You, 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 the cane, you know, my iPhone, my my computer I have uh, voiceover, the text to speech stuff, and then you know you it takes a few months just to learn how to navigate the world. And so once I graduated from from you know the blind rehabilitation. They asked me where I wanted to go, you know, be retired. And I told them I didn't, didn't really want to. Maybe it was still that denial thing. But since I was able-bodied, I was healthy, I asked him to send me to the EOD school and I became an instructor. Did that for a short time. But in the meantime, I was also, uh, like you said, uh, I, I sought out people who had done it before, who found success after injury or blindness or what have you. And I found a guy who... Eric Weinmayer, who is a, no, not a veteran, but he is a blind person who's the first blind person to ever climb Mount Everest. Mm. Uh, and, and has I, been on the Break It Down show. You guys are peers. Mm, no kidding. Yep. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, was, I was actually on a mountain <laughs> this weekend with him. Uh, wow. <laughs> he and I, I, I sought him out. And he, on the 10th anniversary of his Everest climb, he brought a team of wounded veterans up a sister summit to Everest, Labouche. And it became a program. And in 2013, I joined a group called Soldiers of Summits up a 18,000 foot peak in Peru. And that was kind of the launch pad. That was the start, the catalyst for, you know, running marathons and ultra marathons and whitewater kayak, kayaking, you know, speaking and telling my story and finding success and, and happiness after the tragedy and not despite it, but perhaps because of it mm-hmm. are, are, you know, telling people that it is the struggle that we shouldn't be running away from hard times is that because, you know, we, we, we lift weights to get our muscles stronger. It's our struggles, you know, the hardships in our lives that make our heart and our, our mind stronger. So um, I'm doing, I'm, I'm, telling, I'm, I'm preaching this message. And then in 2015, that uh, crack in my skull that, that had gotten patched, I guess either reopened or wasn't completely patched and meningitis had snuck its way into my brain. Bacteria nearly killed me. So um, there I was all over again, this time you know, in the hospital, still because of my injuries, but mm. this time it, it uh, stole what was left of my hearing that the blast, blast didn't take. And it took my vestibular balance, that inner ear balance. And now I'm completely blind, completely deaf. I can't stand on my own too. And those, those, those demons tried to get in again. You know, the, the, uh, what, why me's the, what ifs mm. and what, what, you know, when is this uh, soldier paid his do- fair share? When have I paid my dues? You know, when does it stop? But the rules didn't change. I had to remember what I was telling people. I had to remind myself. And, and I just had to <laughs> remind myself, you know, just, okay, there's some more tools I don't have in my kit. How can I carry on? And I think it's that mentality, that perspective. Do you ever feel when you share that story, there's the message of inspiration and moving on and resistance is good for you? and being someone that's out there and, and speaking to large groups myself, it, you know, there are times when you have self-doubt, is this cliche or has this been told enough or it, are people tired of hearing this message? And every time I talk to someone like you, I'm inspired that those stories are so important. And one of my personal heroes, who's also been on the show, Woody Williams, World War II veteran, Medal of Honor, flamethrower, he told me, you have to continue to tell the story. If you don't, who is going to tell it? And I think what you're doing right now, not just with your business, but you wanting to get out more on stage in small groups, large groups, and share that story, man. I really hope that you continue to do that because I don't think there's ever going to come a day where people should not hear about what 
our great Americans do, what our military does, and really show them that you're an embodiment of everything we are as a country and what we what we do as a military and that you volunteer for this. I mean, and man, after everything you went through, you know, you're sure there's days where you say, yeah, I know, be careful what you ask for. You just might get it because you, you volunteered for this and that, you know, the worst, you know, befell you. And, and, but that's what you and so many guys do that is so, so different from what the average person can even fathom, man. I just love what you're doing, man. And I, I want to, I know we're getting short on time, but I just wanted to say that to you and say, thank you. And please, man, continue to share that story because it's remarkable. I agree that um, there are times when I, I feel like, gosh, am I just, just telling the story? I feel almost embarrassed or bashful about mm. it that, uh, you know, am, am I boasting uh, or am I really you know, rendering some, some aid to others? It, I tell the story because I want to, I want to be help, helpful. I want to pass it on and inspire, motivate, you know, try to keep some of our other, you know, fellow veterans that are having a hard time with their situation gain a little bit of a perspective like I, I do. And, and truth is, I got, like I said, I got, I got a ton of support. My wife is absolutely incredible. You know, I'm, I am just, just a, you know, your average Joe that was put in an extraordinary situation. And just like anybody else, we do what we must when we must. My wife is an example of that. We'd known each other since we were kids because our mothers mm -hmm. were childhood friends. But we'd only reconnected on social media weeks before the meningitis. And we went on our first official date. She was in California. I'm in Florida. I convinced her to fly out to Florida to meet me so we could go on a week-long first date. And it was uh, terrific. But she went back home. Uh, days later, I'm in the hospital with meningitis. She flew right back out and started nursing me back to health. And she was, remember, I'm, I'm deaf and I'm blind. And my whole world was ended at my fingertips. Mm. It's a very lonely, extremely isolating feeling. I don't wish it on anybody. But Michaela was writing every single letter of every word that she had to communicate or anybody else had to communicate to me on the palm of my hand. Mm. It's frustrating and tedious, but it was my only link to the outside because everything I had to help me as a blind person, almost everything was audio-based, talking, phone, computer, audio books, all that kind of stuff, all obsolete. And I uh, was a candidate for cochlear implants, but I had to first over, you know, I had to recover from the meningitis. So it had no infection that took months. And then they do one at a time and I lo lost the hearing in both my ears. They decided to do the more damaged side, the more damaged ear first. You get the surgery, you got to wait till the site heals. And then they can turn the processor on the uh, external device. And then it's months and months of learning and tweaking and tuning because your brain has to learn how to hear an entirely new way. It's because my ears are still turned off. There's a magnet that connects the external device to the internal implant and it connects into the cochlea in the inner ear. And then once that one was turned on, we realized after a few couple of weeks, a few months, that the damage on my right ear was far too extensive and it was useless. Uh, so we did the, the left ear. And thank goodness, after six months of silence, I finally was able to hear my girlfriend's voice at the time. And uh, not long after, I asked her to marry me because wow. that woman's an angel. Because you're not <laughs> stupid. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. I, I could barely even talk. That whole thing, it's, it's just an incredible experience. I mean, anybody who's ever watched the Helen Keller movies, you, you automatically think about, you know, how would I handle that if I was deaf and blind? And your wife now does the Ann Sullivan thing and communicates to you hand through hand. I mean... In a world where people get bent out of shape because they have to wait in line for something, 
you're right. Your wife is something special and, and, and you are too. We're really long on time and I want to make sure people understand a couple things. Uh, they can go to eodfudge.com and, and buy your fantastic product. If you guys have any doubt about what a guy Aaron is, you just, just, you've heard it right here. Support this guy. You don't got a hair in your ass if you don't go and buy some chocolates and some confections right now from this man as he fights and fights and inspires people. You've heard Eric on the show. You've heard Aaron on the show now. These guys are, they're special. And, you know, you deserve our support, man. And I'm, but next thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go buy some confections and send them off to a friend who doesn't, isn't expecting it. So hopefully they'll continue to pass that chocolate around the world because... I just, I love what you're doing. I love who you are. And the thought about my world ending at my fingertips. I don't know how I would respond to that, but I'm, but I'm proud of how you've done it. And I, I'm proud to know you. I really yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Oh, thank you guys. 